Hello, I am Dr. Ryan Alcantara with USC Rossier Career Services, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the USC Rossier Leadership Series, an ongoing series that showcases alumni leaders in the field. Today is our conversation with a college president, and I am delighted to be joined by Dr. Ryan Corner, president and superintendent of Glendale Community College and a two-time graduate of USC. He has served in, in role of president since July of 2022. As the leader of Glendale Community College, Dr. Corner is dedicated to fostering an environment that promotes an ethic of care for students and the community through empathy, respect, and trust. Dr. Corner, Dr. Corner centers his work on building consensus and a mutual vision for the college. His collaborative approach of leadership encourages experimentation and innovation to better support students. He believes academic success thrives on engaging students inside and outside the classroom and creates an environment that enhances learning and allows self-exploration. Dr. Corner has 12 years of teaching within the community college and university systems, including providing instruction in the Master of Higher Education counseling program at USC, uh, prior to the position at Glendale Community College, Dr. Coroner served as Vice Chancellor Educational Programs and Institutional Effectiveness for the Nine College LA Community College District. And previous to that, he served as the Associate Vice President for Strategic Planning and Innovation at Pasadena City College and Dean of Institutional Effectiveness at East Los Angeles College. A native of Southern California, Dr. Coroner earned his doctorate of education and master of social work at the University of Southern California and holds a bachelor of science in psychology from UC San Diego. Dr. Corner, welcome. And thank you for joining us today to share your story. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you again for, for being here. And I'm gonna um, turn the floor over to you to, to provide some introductory comments, and then we'll be opening it up for questions from, uh, from our participants. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, so again, good afternoon, everyone. This is always a little bit strange doing a webinar because I'm staring at names and not seeing faces. Uh, so I'm, I'm very much interested in getting to the Q&A because um, I'm sure you have questions and I love my best to try to answer them. Uh, you know, and kind of thinking about how to approach this, I know that there's people in different segments of their career uh, starting out in the middle of their career, uh, even some who have just turned college presidents from some of the questions sent ahead of time. And I, I thought it'd be kind of a good spread just to start with um, how my journey landed me here at Glendale Community College. Um, going through school, I really was not focused on being part of the educational system uh, for employment. In fact, I, I really truly thought that I was gonna be a clinician and that I'd be working with um, uh, particularly mental health um, patients uh, throughout my career. Uh, and so after finishing my, my undergraduate degree, I went to USC School of Social Work with really that intention. Um, you know, I was really drawn to the field of social work because it was a field that wanted to help people. Uh, it was a field that tried to see where there were strengths in communities and individuals and how we could rely on those strengths to, to build capacity and really to support individuals. Uh, it was great. Uh, I loved working with my patients. Uh, I was working at Cedars-Sinai uh, doing uh, different research and clinical work uh, related to drug addiction, dual diagnosis, and I was enjoying it immensely, and I was given the opportunity to teach a class, uh, biological psychology at Pierce College, a local community college, and it took one semester to really realize that that's where I wanted to be. Uh, it was something I didn't expect. Um, I, I went into teaching thinking that this was something that would be uh, entertaining and, and fun to do on the side, and I just, I had no idea how fulfilling it would be to work with the students. And I had no idea how interconnected higher education would be and would feel for me at, at a more of a personal level um, with what I wanted to do in social work. Uh, it became so clear that working within the higher education system and particularly with community colleges was this direct alignment with the values that 
I was seeking in terms of working in social work, uh, that education was a strategic and a structural solution to many of the issues that we were trying to um, address through social work, through working with communities, and that uh, this was something that I very much wanted to continue to do. Uh, unfortunately, and I, I don't know if anybody else had shared uh, this experience, I really had no training in higher education uh, when I started to teach. Um, I like to joke with my students that the week before school started, I was given keys in a book and I was lucky to get both. Uh, and that's how I, I started teaching. And I taught the way I had been taught, uh, but without no, without any real instruction in effective pedagogy, how to work with students, how to really understand uh, the learning experience. And that's what really brought me to USC's uh, Rossier School of Education to get my doctorate is I just felt that if I was going to make a change and really work within a higher education setting, I, I needed more. Uh, I really needed the opportunity to to learn and to grow and to better understand things from a learning respect rather than just a um, mental health perspective. Uh, and I loved my time at Rossier. Um, during that time, I transitioned uh, to East Los Angeles College, uh, where I served uh, originally as an associate dean of research, uh, which was a really interesting way. And, and sometimes this is the way it happens is you're the right person at the right time. Uh, and it's just that that kismet that happens. Uh, they were looking for somebody who had a research experience, which I did with my role in clinical research, and somebody who understood research and could explain it to the faculty that were impacted. And because I had been teaching, uh, it was a natural fit. And I was able to get into that role and then progressed on to the Dean of Institutional Effectiveness. Um, and I want to focus here a little bit on being a dean of institutional effectiveness, because it's not the most common administrative role in higher education. It's not the most common role, even within the community college setting. Uh, usually, there's one, if that, on each campus. Um, but one of the unique aspects in this role is that I was uh, given the opportunity to be in charge of program review to be in charge of student learning outcomes, to be in charge of research, and to be in charge of planning and accreditation. Now, what ties all five of those things together is that I had a lot of responsibilities and absolutely zero authority or reporting lines to get the job done. Um, you know, people reported through their department chairs. They reported through their deans of academic affairs or student services. And it was a really interesting experience to be in a role where we needed to move the institution forward and yet there was no ability to say, this is what we're gonna do. Uh, the only ability in that role that I really had was to try to convince people that this is the way we should go through things together. And I think that was probably one of the best things that could have ever happened in my career um, because it led me down a path of leadership where instead of saying, this is the best direction to go, it's how do we build consensus for where we need to go. And so working with faculty leaders, other administrative leaders, classified staff and students became part and parcel of what I did for almost 10 years, uh, moving on to Pasadena and then another uh, almost 10 years with the LA district. And uh, the LA district, um, I had very similar responsibilities, except for that I was also in charge of academic and student affairs for the district office. Uh, now, this was a really interesting role because um, there are 30 vice presidents in the LA Community College District. Uh, there are nine college presidents. There are 10 academic Senate presidents. And there are about 60 chapter chairs of different unions. And so once again, it put this situation forward where um, you have the opportunity to really work towards building consensus and seeing exactly what can be achieved. And I love the work I did. Uh, but there was one thing missing from really working at a district office, and uh, that was the students. Um, I desperately missed being on a campus, and I started looking for a transition to um, be on a campus, to be in a leadership role where I could have an opportunity to, to work with students again and to really impact uh, that student experience. And uh, I was very lucky, and I'm blessed to be here at Glendale Community College because it's a place that I feel really aligns with the values. 
Um, and that will be something to, to kind of circle back around. Um, but now I've now been here at Glendale Community College for about the last year and a half. Um, I've had the opportunity to um, work with very gifted faculty and administrative leaders and to build something up. Uh, and that's been one of the uh, great pleasures in being in this role is that uh, Glendale Community College is kind of a sleepy giant. Um, it's a community college that has exceptional talent uh, in terms of its faculty and staff. It has uh, exceptional success rates and uh, we don't talk a lot about ourselves. And so this was an opportunity to really build and see what we can achieve. And even in the last year and a half, we've been able to really uh, set the mark in terms of looking at um, progressing the college along three pillars. Uh, the first pillar is building an ethic of care. Uh, really what we are hoping to achieve here as an institution is that every student steps on campus with such a sense of belonging that they understand that they're cared for. Um, I've gone as far to say that I, I completely plan on my children coming in here to GCC and um, my expectation is that every student that steps foot on this campus will be treated the same as my students or my kids are treated. Um, because ultimately all of our students um, should be thought of as how we would treat our families. Uh, that's how much we should care about their success. Uh, the second pillar we're really working on is diversity, inclusion, equity, and access. Um, there's been a lot of good work here, but similar to, I think, many institutions in higher education, at some point, the, the good work and the conversations need to turn to actions and you need to actually see impact uh, with your students. And you actually need to see impact with your faculty and staff. And you actually need to move the needle. And that's really where we're focusing now is how do we take the lessons that we've learned from successes and failures and really make sure that we have a bigger impact. Uh, and it's it's been a, a wonderful thing to be in a role where we can actually get that done. Uh, the third pillar that we've really been working on is innovation. And this speaks to a larger uh, conversation about the pressing issues that are impacting higher education. Um, I think from a existential level, one of the biggest issues we have in higher education is enrollment. Um, enrollment has not recovered from COVID yet. Uh, it's not close in many cases. And in some states, it's uh, not recovered much at all. Uh, and I think a lot of people go immediately to COVID and they say, well, we haven't recovered from COVID yet. But uh, COVID was actually an accelerator for a larger issue that we were facing with students. And this is an issue that the value of education has really shifted. Uh, this modern generation sees things differently than previous educations have. Um, you know, my generation, previous generations were brought in by parents who said, you have to have higher education in order to have a successful life. Uh, it became an expectation, became a middle-class expectation that people would become highly, higher educated and they would get better positions, which would give them a better life. And yet we don't see that for everybody who's followed that path. Um, we have students who have parents who still have hundreds of thousands of dollars of student loans. And imagine that conversation around the dinner room, dinner room table. Um, yes, going to higher education is good, but hey, look at me. I have a lot of loans still. And now we're talking about you taking some out. Uh, there are a generation who has seen people older than them graduate from college and not be able to afford a house. And so this value of education has really shifted. And with that shift, some of the promises what we have in higher education don't seem to sway the way that they used to. Uh, and that's one big problem and something that we need to work on to make our, our own systems more relevant and more palatable to uh, students as they come through. But related to that, you would be able to combat that if you had an educational system that students really bought into. And this modern generation has some really interesting beliefs and thoughts. They're, they're a group that have grown up with technology at their hands from the minute they were born. And to them, more than any other generation, learning is more broad than education. And that's something that's really interesting. I see it in my own kids. 
you know, if I ask them, what did you learn today? They don't just answer about what they learned in school. They may answer about something that they saw on the internet or, or learned on YouTube. To them, learning is very different. And they are going to seek from us explanation of how our learning is more powerful than learning that they may get at other institutions uh, uh, or through other means even. Uh, you know, I don't think that our biggest competitor in higher education is other higher education institutions. Uh, it's Google. It's YouTube. Uh, it's the belief that people have that they can learn something not through higher education, but through unstructured learning that's self-paced. And you see those organizations actually working to enhance that and to build that out uh, with Amazon having their own uh, training facilities and things like that. And so we really need to fully look at the model of education we have and really recognize that this is a model of education that was built on an industrialized civilization that doesn't exist anymore. That our model of education was created almost a hundred years ago, or in some cases more than a hundred years ago, and very little has shifted in the way that we address students' needs. Very little has shifted in the way that we approach uh, things like general education and what students need to take. And that this generation is, is recognizing that. Um, I will be the first one to say I don't have any solutions to that right now, but I think it's a conversation that we haven't had enough about and that we haven't included youth in those conversations quite enough to really understand where they're coming from and that if we are truly going to build more equitable, inclusive environments, it has to be with respect for what a student brings to us. It has to be that st strengths-based approach. And part of that means that there are students on our campus who have learned a lot of information, a lot of knowledge, and a lot of skills prior to stepping foot on our doorstep. And how do we recognize that? How do we build that out? And how do we create systems that really support students and say that we value who you are and your previous learning is part of who you are? And this is going to be one of the greatest challenges that we face in higher education institutions coming forward. Um, as we go to questions, I'll, I'll kind of close with um, some thoughts about uh, my experience at Rossier and how it relates to looking for leadership positions in higher education in general. Uh, I think one of the unique factors um, with USC and with Rossier is that it is value-based. Uh, they do not shy away from who they are. Uh, you can look in the newly revised mission statement in terms of what the institution supports and what it's trying to achieve. And equity is at its core. And understanding that uh, there has been a bias, that higher education has been a system that was developed for white men and has not changed in generations is built into what is taught. It's built into what we learn and it's built into how do we disrupt the system so that we can actually have more effective learning and more effective opportunities for all of our students, regardless of where they come from. And I think that that was very powerful in terms of the experience at Ross Air, uh, having instructors that deeply believed that, that were leaders. And, and I do mean leaders, not just people who are uh, experts in the field, but people who had those conversations happening before it was typical and even before it was attractive to have those conversations that pushed the agenda of having equity be at the center of learning um, before it was popular. And that was something that was powerful and that has traveled with me throughout uh, the different positions I've been in. And as it relates to the work here that we're doing at Glendale, and this is kind of something to think of in terms of uh, your own higher education leadership experience, um, not every institution is the right fit for every person when you look at a leadership role. Um, I've certainly been at institutions where I felt that I would not be able to achieve uh, what I'd hoped I could achieve at that institution. Um, but here at Glendale, I know this is a place that I can do that. Uh, and I, I know that because it is very easy going through an interview process to try to diagnose what you think people expect you to say and what will get you the job. And what I would encourage everybody to do is to never do that. Um, approaching, uh, looking for this next leadership position and landing here at Glendale, I, I made the decision to be true to myself, to really say exactly what I believed, 
to not shy away from the issues um, like the fact that uh, one of the largest loss of enrollment through COVID has been with our Latinx students and that we've been unable to achieve parity in that. Uh, to have conversations uh, throughout the interview process that make it clear that that's gonna be an area that we need to focus on. Uh, to be very clear that equity and inclusion will be one of the bases of what we go through. And that way it really assures that when you get hired, you're not by, being hired into a situation that doesn't share your values and that doesn't give you the opportunity to achieve what you really believe the vision of higher education to be. Um, so uh, that is uh, kind of a, a, a nutshell of where, uh, where I've been and where I am and where I think we need to go as institutions. Uh, as I said, I'm really looking forward to hearing some questions. I've seen some that were sent in and I'll pass off to Ryan to, to start us off. Wonderful. Thank you so much for, for that. You, you certainly um, gave us a lot to, to think about as, as we engage in this conversation. I'll, uh, and we do have some, some questions up and I'll invite participants to post uh, to the, the Q&A and we will certainly get to those questions. I will just say, you know, there's a lot of sticky issues that we face within higher education. And I wanted to, to share with our participants today that um, Dean Naguera recently launched um, an initiative to engage dialogue across um, our higher ed leaders, uh, alums of, of Rossier. And, and thank you so much, uh, Dr. Corner, for participating in that. And, you know, as you raise some of those existential issues in higher education, you know, oftentimes we've got to look at this through an intersegmental approach. And, and I certainly think that Rossier provides a, a wonderful forum for, for those kinds of conversations because we can't solve it just in the community college or, or just, you know, in the CSU or the UC or, or private institutions. It's really thinking about how we can uh, attack these issues across segments with a commitment to, to students, first and foremost. Um, so let's, we, we've got a, a question posted actually from a uh, um, Lindale Community College alum. Um, what skills do you think our participants or students should be sharpening um, to be prepared for those senior leadership positions? You know, what do you look for in a newly minted um, EDD student? You know, that's, uh, that's a really good question. And uh, Stella, um, uh, once a VAC, always a VAC. So I know you're part of the family here and um, happy to, to have you join. Uh, for those who don't know, we're the Vaqueros. So that's uh, one of the things that we share in terms of our um, connection here. Um, I, I would probably say two things when we're looking at the senior leadership role. Uh, first and foremost, um, I think one of the gaps in leadership, and we do have a lot of gaps in leadership right now um, throughout systems of higher education, beyond the community college, within the Cal States, UCs, everywhere, it's being harder, becoming harder and harder to find folks that are gonna be able to do um, what we need them to do to lead institutions. Uh, and I think one of the biggest gaps is the ability to take yourself out of the specific unit that you're working on and seeing the impact from a global perspective. Uh, and I mean that from a positive aspect and also from a, a negative aspect. On the positive side, when you're advocating for your program, uh, when you're trying to establish that what you're doing has broader meaning to an institution or more appropriately even to the community at large, there needs to be the ability to situate what you're doing in your role and how it impacts the broader concepts. Uh, so if you're looking at being a, a dean of student services and you're o overseeing a counseling department or a student affairs department, if you're at a university, um, it's not enough to really be the expert at that level um, because you'll have a lot of competition in terms of people who have had experience and expertise in that level. The question is, do you, are you able to, to describe the ways in which what you're doing impacts the broader aspect of the student experience and what it brings to the community. And that becomes uh, a real challenge. Um, sometimes we think that there's uh, opportunities um, uh, and 
we also miss the negative aspect. Um, you're not going to get a yes every time you ask for something, uh, particularly at community colleges when our economics are 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 so tight. And um, it can sometimes be frustrating to look at it and to turn to a straight model of, I'm going to advocate for my program, I'm going to advocate for my program, I'm going to advocate for my program. I think that uh, individuals need to really have an opportunity to look at the program as a whole, where it's placed in the campus and understand the broader needs and be willing to understand that there are times where there might be priorities that are beyond what you may be supervising. And I think that that's sometimes a challenge because people feel like they're not giving it their all to the department they supervise. But really what it is, is um, building a skill set to be at that next level of leadership and understand that there's competitive needs and we're never going to have the resources or the time to really focus on everything we need to do. Uh, the second thing that I would say is creativity. Um, more than anything else, I think we see people try to replicate programs and experiences that they've seen that have worked but we rarely see people who are willing to look outside of the box and try something new. Um, you know, there, there was a speech that I, I hearken back to a lot from um, uh, actually uh, President Roosevelt uh, speaking to a graduating class. And he often said, um, he, he said in this speech, uh, it makes sense to try something. If it fails, admit it frankly, but above all, try something because people will not wait when the things that they need are easily within reach. And I, I think about that a lot, even though it's almost a hundred year old quote, because there's so much that we can do for our students. And yet sometimes inertia prevents us from trying to do something that could be done right now. And I think operating with that sense of urgency and with creativity to be willing to try something new. And if it doesn't work to stop doing that, and then trying something that's next. Uh, I think as educators, we have such a deep belief in our students and we're so concerned that we might do wrong that we don't try to do what's right. And so I would just highly encourage people that in their leadership roles, be that senior leader before you have a senior leadership position by doing those two things, being creative and making sure that you understand the broader scope of where your position is situated. Yeah, wonderful, thank you. Um, Beverly has a, has a couple questions, but I want to jump to the second one. You know, what does mentorship and sponsorship look like at this point in your career? And what advice do you have both kind of the responsibility of, of that in your career, but as, as well as I, I find my, myself trying to encourage students to go out and, and ask for help. Um, and I think there's sometimes a reluctancy of, of requesting that. So I, I think that's a great question of, of framing those issues. So uh, first, what I'll say is as you're getting into your career and moving up your career, always seek out mentors. Um, you know, there's not a single individual you can't learn from. Uh, they may not do it the way that you would do it, but you may learn something. Uh, in my last role, there were 22 presidents that made their way through LA Community College District in the seven years that I was there. 22. That's That's how the turnover is. And I can honestly say that I've learned something from each one of them, uh, whether it be from looking at successes or looking at failures. And uh, people want to be mentors. Uh, you may think that you're bothering people by asking them to, to mentor you, but honestly, they, they will see it as an honor. Uh, they see it as a sense of pride and you should definitely seek that out. I would say at this point in the career, um, I hearken back to something that uh, a mentor and colleague of mine said, which is um, being the CEO is a lonely job. Um, because when you're a VP, you get to whine to the other VPs about what the president's doing and what's going on and things like that. When you're a dean, you get to whine about the VPs with your other deans. When you're a faculty member, you get to whine about everybody. Um, that's what tenure brings. And that's that's one of the pride of, of what they do. Uh, and, you know, it's it's those opportunities where you need an outlet, you need to vent, you need to be able to talk to somebody who understands things at your level and everybody seeks that out. Uh, the difference is at, at a single institution like this, there is no other counterpart. And so you have to look to colleagues. Um, the community college presidents network is actually pretty tight. Uh, there's um, 
over a hundred of us and we meet regularly. We talk regularly. There's subgroups within that group. Um, you know, there's, uh, there's a group of us that at every conference, when everybody goes to bed, we go out and we, we talk and we share what's going on in our world, even if it's not looking for advice, which often it is, but just so that somebody can say, yeah, I understand what that's like. Um, so I would say that, um, looking for that mentorship, even, uh, at this level is important. I'm going to just give a lot of credit where credit is due. Uh, one of my mentors and somebody that I look to um, a lot uh, is uh, Erica Andrew Jonas. Uh, Dr. Andrew Jonas is uh, the president currently at Santa Barbara City College. She was at Valley College and PCC. And I've learned a lot from her and she's incredibly smart. She's very sophisticated. And when I have a problem that I don't know how to solve, I call Erica so that we can talk through things. And what's great is we don't all, we don't always agree. Uh, we may vehemently disagree with how to take a situation, but it's the level of respect that we have for one another to hear each other out and to understand that um, that that we've been through this together. And uh, I think that everybody needs that mentor out there who can really tell you to your face when they think you're doing things wrong. Um, because sometimes your your employees may not feel free to do that. As much as I try and as much as I know you all will try to make sure that there's an environment where people can feel free to uh, speak truth to power, there's always going to be hesitation. And it's awkward stepping into this role, realizing that you are that seat of power now that people may not be willing to be completely honest with. And so you need to have that mentorship. You need to have colleagues that are willing to tell you when you screwed up. Right. I, I, th this question kind of reminds me of, uh, of Brian, how we first met and I'll, I'll use this point to, to both thank you for that. And, and as advice to folks, um, because I had, you were at Pasadena city college at the time, and I had an interest in, in some positions that were coming online there. And I just reached out cause you were a fellow Trojan. Um, I think it was on LinkedIn and we connected and you were very generous with your time and providing a, a, a tour of the campus. I came out and we had, we had a conversation. Um, and so I, I say that to thank you publicly um, for your time, but also as a reminder to, to students, like that's the power of the Trojan Network, you know, having, having the, the willingness to put yourself out there, ask for assistance, you know, you, you, you won't always get, people won't always be as generous as, as you were with me, um, but you can certainly get those insights. And that's what we, we really do encourage people um, in career services here at Rossier of looking to build that network and getting to know people and asking for that help because, because we are very willing to, uh, to support. And, and eventually you ask for help and, and that can evolve into a, a, a mentorship relationship and, and things like that. And, and that's how, how we grow as, as professionals. And it's important to ask for those requests and be ready to receive it on the other end too. Uh, you know, we've got, um, I'm sure we've got some master students on this call as well as doctoral students. And so there's a lot of opportunity within this community of, of students helping students and alumni helping um, uh, alumni as well. Um, uh, another question that has come up in, in regards to, you know, what was your most unexpected thing that you learned in that tr transition to uh, a Swiss uh, C-suite, um, what are your thoughts? Um, it, it's it's kind of an interesting question because uh, in my previous role uh, at at the district level, it, it was an executive position, but it was not one that um, that you are the you are the one who gets to make all the decisions. Uh, what I can tell you is. Um, I, I would think of two things. One is I learned that I'm a lot more willing to try things differently when it's only me at risk. Um, and what I mean by that is, um, you know, I had the great privilege to work under uh, Dr. Francisco Rodriguez, who's at the LA Community College District. Um, he's a tremendous man. He's a tremendous leader. And when you're working under somebody you have a heavy responsibility to make sure that you're not risking them in what you do. 
And so it narrows uh, kind of the opportunities that you might want to do because you want to make sure that you don't put them in a situation that is uncomfortable. Um, being uh, in the C-suite, as you put it, uh, one of the, the pleasant surprises was I realized that I was much less risk adverse than I thought I was. Um, because if things go wrong, it's on me, it's on me to fix, and it doesn't impact anyone else. And that gave me a lot of freedom to try things differently and just to, to force things through in ways that sometimes maybe I, I wouldn't have. Um, you know, a great example would be that uh, we were uh, working with our Black Student Union uh, and they had in 2020, um, following uh, the murder of George Floyd, asked for space uh, for the Black Student Union, uh, space to be with each other, to commune and to have, you know, that that important experience um, of togetherness. And nobody had really responded. Um, now, a lot of that was because of COVID and things like that, but it was coming back up again. And um, I realized we had a building that was coming offline right before this, I was walking our new science building and our old science building is gonna be empty. And I asked, what are we putting in there? And they said, um, classrooms. I said, do, do we need classrooms? Not right now. Uh, and so that will be the site of a new 9,000 square foot student inclusion center. Uh, and it was just something that uh, I was able to say that we need it, we're going to do it, and we're going to let the students design it. We worked with uh, Dr. Frank Harris out of San Diego State to really, uh, also alum, uh, to really uh, make sure that we, we did it right. Um, and I don't think I would have had the courage to do that in any other um, role. Uh, I would say on the other side, the thing to be aware of um, is that the higher up you get, the fewer people you get to talk to, unless you make a cognizant effort to do that. And so I'll, I'll tell you one of the biggest mistakes I made right upon starting. We were coming out of COVID. Uh, we had to decide how we were gonna deal with masking. Uh, how we were going to do with vaccine mandates. Uh, the county was pulling the requirements, but what were we going to do as an institution? I talked to everyone that you're supposed to talk to. I talked to the academic senate president. They were in agreement with our model. Talked to the uh, faculty union. They were in agreement with our model. Talked to the staff union. Talked with uh, my management team. And, you know, the 10 of us right there, we all agreed this is the way we were going to do it. Uh, and I made the critical mistake to thought to uh, to think that they had talked to other people. And uh, in fact, they hadn't even talked with their own leadership teams. And so when we sent out the, hey, here's how we're going to handle this. We're all in agreement. It was a shock and a surprise to a great number of people. And it led to a lot of backlash that we had to address um, and a lot of work that didn't have to be had because there was an expectation that that I thought was happening on my part that that wasn't. And so it really taught me that um, particularly with big and, and decisions that are going to impact larger groups of people, um, it's not enough to follow governance. Uh, you have to actively seek out opinions of folks who are leaders on your campus who may not have formal leadership roles. Uh, you need to talk to those informal leaders that sway people's opinions and have a pulse of the campus. And that was something that um, having worked through governance um, for many, many years, there was an expectation that wasn't met and it it was a shock to me. Yeah, very, very important, that stakeholder engagement. Um, I, I wanna tack to a question that we got, uh, was submitted in the registration process um, that, that seems timely. So from your perspective as a, President, how do you, how do you you know maintain and enable opportunities for free and open dialogue, particularly as we deal with you know the divisive nature of, of both national and, and international um, matters these days? Um, so it's a, it's a good question, and what I will say first, just in general, um, irrespective. I try really hard to make sure that there's open communication. Um, uh, one of the folks that I, I was very blessed to see in action was uh, um, a former chancellor, uh, Rocky Young. And Rocky um, had a, a sign above his door 
that he could see from his computer and it said, have you talked to a student today? Um, and so every day he was walking the campus, he was talking to students, he was having those opportunities to engage. And uh, people said, hey, when do you actually get work done? And he said, when no one's here. And I think that that's a really important lesson that um, in any leadership role, if you haven't left your office that day, you're doing something wrong. Um, because knowing and ha and building those knowing people and building those relationships on your campus are are as important as any work that you can do that has an end result. Um, because you won't get what you need to get until you have folks who are going to back you. Uh, so I would say um, one is you need to be present. Uh, you need to walk the campus. You need to be willing to step away from your desk, away from your computer, uh, go to professional development events go to uh, faculty and student events. Uh, there were two, there's a faculty and a student event at the same time today, um, making sure that we went to those. Um, I have office hours the same way faculty have office hours. Uh, that was something I learned uh, from a mentor uh, is, um, you know, have coffee with the president or whatever. I, I do think coffee goes a long way. If anyone comes into my office, they will be offered a cup of coffee or tea because, um, you know, I, I think that, it, it's an opportunity to realize that um, we're all just people sitting around a table having important conversations. Um, I will say that, that that does sometimes come with problems. Um, I've had critiques um, from my management group that they sometimes feel that because I'm some, so open that people might go around the, the leadership ladder just to have a direct conversation with me. And, and I think that's a fair critique. And it's something that I've had to be cognizant of and how to balance the difference between listening and uh, solving something and doing the job that isn't yours to do anymore. And that that's a learning curve. Um, I would say related to uh, what's been going on on campus, I think it, what it really comes down to is uh, that ethic of care. Um, we need to think of students and employees as more than just students and employees, uh, which means that they're going to be impacted differently depending on their background, where, where they're from, uh, what their beliefs are by all the events that happen, um, whether it be um, particularly important in our community here, uh, Azerbaijan and Artsakh, um, which probably most didn't, didn't follow too much because it wasn't um, uh, quite the media sensation, uh, whether it be um, looking at Israel and Gaza. Um, these are things that weigh on people beyond what they're doing in their, their capacities at the school. And so I do think that um, when you look towards balancing that, uh, Ryan, it's really about um, just being willing to be empathetic and to seek understanding of students and employees as people first and their position second. Thank you. Um, our next question comes from Vivian. What methods do you employ to assess students' academic and personal success? And how do you determine the effectiveness of those strategies? Uh, you know, uh, I can tell you that some of that is built into education. Uh, of course, we're looking at um, how many of our students complete degrees, how many complete certificates, what the class pass rates are, all of those things uh, in terms of that. Uh, I think equally important is looking at how students do when they leave us. Uh, how well prepared did they feel when they go to USC because we're the third largest feed feeder in the country to go to USC. Um, and I, I would say if we looked at student count, I would I would count us as pound for pound number one, Ryan, but we, we can have arguments with other community colleges about that another day. Um, you know, I think it's important to really assess how prepared students felt. Um, but there's a new trend in terms of looking at uh, the assessment of success that is going out there. And it's uh, uh, Aspen Institute calls it success 3.0. And it's the hardest to measure. And I won't say that we have the most effective way to do it, but I think if we set that as the marker, it's it's the way to um, make sure that the, the things I've already mentioned are achieved is how well do students do when they're done with their career? How do they impact the community? How do they impact um, 
their families? How do, how do they live their lives? Um, and I'll say that uh, I stepped into an amazing culture here. Um, in fact, uh, uh, on our, our wall over here at our student center, they have a list of uh, student body presidents that helped support uh, a building that went up uh, as a student union. And three of those student body presidents uh, within a five-year period are vice presidents of student services in local community colleges within LA. Three of them. Um, I think that's pretty good success. And the question is, how do we get towards that? Um, we have transitioned to doing a lot of evaluation in terms of how well people do in terms of uh, post-educational employment. Uh, it is harder with community colleges because uh, some students may be looking to get a, a PhD and, and we're not going to see what their employment is for eight years. But I think uh, ultimately um, that that is what we should look towards in terms of um, personal success. Um, in terms of uh, uh, knowing how effective those strategies are, um, some of it is quantitative, uh, actually looking at whether or not people found employment in their field, whether or not they're uh, able to have a living or maybe even a thriving wage. Um, but I do believe that we have to do a lot more in terms of outreach to alumni and just asking them, um, you know, indirectly. And I think we've even seen it with some folks on here. There's a lot of people who've had good experiences at this college. And I think that's what we need to look at, but we need to find a way to make it more structured and quantitative in terms of our assessment. Great. Thank you. Our next question um, a few angles, uh, and we can parse this out, but uh, what advice do you have for an aspiring woman, uh, woman college president who spent her first 20 years in student affairs role? So I, I, I would say, you know, there's a piece of that of yeah. how do you approach it from a student affairs perspective, but also what advice do you have for, um, from women, for women, particularly that are aspiring to college presidencies? Yeah, um, you know, let me let me touch on the uh, the gender aspects uh, first. And I really hope the person who asked this is uh, is here because I think it's a brilliant question, uh, and I'm glad I got it ahead of time because it it gave me an opportunity to really think. Um, first of all, I think that everybody should recognize the gender inequity that's happening in leadership. Um, we've made really good progress in terms of uh, parity in hiring. Uh, in fact, uh, as part of the Women's Caucus at, at the Community College League of California event that we were at recently, um, we, we were able to show that half of the newly hired presidents had been women. And that was progress, uh, long, uh, long way coming. Uh, and that was progress. That, uh, that was reaching parity. Um, but where there is no parity is the longevity. Um, recent studies amongst our our uh, CEO counterparts have really shown that the average tenure of a college president is about four years. Um, which think about that. I mean, how do you, how much do you even accomplish in a four year period? Um, and for women, it's less. Uh, and that is not because uh, uh, female uh, leadership is less quality or less ability. Um, it's because there's a lot of bias built into um, uh, a lot of bias built into uh, how people look at gender roles in leadership. Uh, there's a lot of privilege that become comes from being a male leader that I may be able to get away with the things that um, my female mentor might not. And uh, I think that men in leadership positions need to recognize that, they need to call it out, and they need to support um, female leaders in their roles to be able to do what they need to do effectively. Um, with elected boards, I have seen definitively that they treat female presidents differently. Uh, they may not know they're doing it, it may be unconscious bias, but I've seen it happen. And it's not always the male board members who are doing it. Um, it's a, a equal gender opportunist in terms of um, uh, bias in, in leadership. And so I, I think that related to that as somebody who's coming into a CEO role, it's finding uh, that mentor, going back to that original question, because it is going to be challenging and you will need opportunities to talk about the bias, 
the prejudice and the discrimination that is faced for for women in leadership. And um, without that outlet, it, it will feel very isolating. Uh, the good news is there's a lot of powerful female um, presence uh, in presidencies. Uh, some are retired, like he Helen Benjamin and uh, Constance Carroll. Uh, they're still around helping us out. And I think that they are um, some of the best leaders that this system has ever seen, irrespective of gender. Um, I think that there's a lot of women in leadership right, roles right now that can serve that function. Uh, the Women's Caucus is one that can really be a powerful ally. It's not just CEOs, it's also community college trustees, uh, and that's helpful. Um, if you're at a university level, it's just about finding that, that group that can help mentor. But let me flip it a little to the student services angle too. Um, and that goes back to that initial question about what what we may want to look at in um, in how and how 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 we need to see higher leadership, and what I would say is, just make sure you're not being a student services VP. Um, if you came out of student affairs, uh, make sure you're being president and you're not doing the job of your VP. If you came out of academic affairs, make sure you're being the president and you're not being the VP of instruction. And it's hard because you'll see people doing things differently than you would do them. And you have to let it go. Um, who knows that their decisions may be better than we may have thought of. And in many cases, I've, I've been able to see that. Um, so I, I would just suggest that coming from student affairs, learn everything you can about the areas that you're not an expert in. Be willing to listen and really making sure that um, uh, that in that transition, it's very easy to default to what you're good at. Uh, and push yourself to be responsible for the areas that are more challenging to you. Great. Um, we're coming close to, to wrapping up here. I, I wanted to squeeze in a, a couple more questions. Um, sure. There's, we had a, a question on the registration related to the database for um, community college standby teaching candidates. But I wanted to add to that too, um, of just how, if you want to land an adjunct position at a community college, how do you approach that? Um, because I get a lot of questions of that from our students. So uh, I put in the chat and uh, uh, not the Q&A, but the chat. I, I, first of all, I put in my number, my cell phone number and my uh, email for those who, who want follow up. Um, if you text me, just let me know who you are. So I, I don't think it's a, a listener of some sort. Um, uh, but I also put in the chat uh, CCC registry for community colleges. There is a place that we all list positions open, but it is not a place where you apply for the positions. There's no central repository or database for saying, hey, I'm applying for all 116 colleges the way we have for students. But there is a place where we list all those positions. And in that system, you can actually designate what positions you're looking for, provide your email, and they will tell you when those positions come up. Um, so that's a good way to get a feel for it. Uh, every district has its own process for hiring. Most of them involve um, most of them involve a paper screening and meeting with a division chair at, at a, or department chair at a minimum for the adjunct positions. Uh, for full time positions, it's a much more um, robust process. Um, but knowing that. What I would say is the key role that you want to network with, that you want to get to know, uh, are the department or division chairs for for where you want to work. Um, I cannot get you an adjunct job in psychology, as an example. Uh, but you know who can is the department chair of psychology. Uh, adjunct positions are not even going to come across my desk. The only positions that presidents hire are the full-time positions and the management positions. Um, the rest happen at different levels of management. And so it's important to do that networking. Uh, I will say that some folks are more uh, happy about this than others. So it really depends on the personality of the folks you're reaching out to. But what I would highly encourage is um, reaching out to division chairs and going back to what Ryan had mentioned earlier, just ask them, say, hey, I'd really like some mentorship. I'm very interested in pursuing a career like you how did you get to where you're getting and can you help me? And you'd be amazed at how many people are willing to help you. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like to think of that as informational interviews and 
And I, I definitely think adjunct, certainly at the university level, but I think the community college level, you know, the, the work is developing that network and that relationship, getting insights from, from those folks that are hiring of, of what they are looking for. Because at the end of the day, a lot of those decisions, in my experience, it's a stack of resumes that are on the desk and they're trying to figure out like, oh, I've got a vacancy to fill for a, a, a section that's opened next semester. And, and so being that that person that's that's had an informal conversation is sometimes useful. Yeah. Great. So as we wrap up, I, I uh, thank you so very much for sharing some time with our students and alumni here at USC Rossier. Uh, Dr. Corner, really do appreciate um, all of the insight, your your um, generosity with, with with your time, and um, but closing it out, we, we certainly have a lot of aspiring um, college presidents and, and leaders throughout higher education on the call. What what are your kind of closing remarks or, or feedback that you might have for folks? I would just say um, continue to lead where your heart is, where your values are. Uh, be true to yourself because the more authentic um, you are, the more people read that authenticity and they respond to it. Um, it's a lot easier to get people to rally behind you um, saying what you value than what you think you should do. And uh, I think that will make you feel real to the people who are supporting you and rallying behind you and will really make sure that you land a position at an institution that values who you are and not just your skills and background. Great. Thank you so very much. Um, as we close thing up, I close things up here, my um, final words of advice here, don't forget career prep. If you're anticipating being in a job search within the next year, even if it's two years down the line, you know, save yourself the heartache and start now. So develop a plan, you know, identify, um, you know, regions or institutions that you're interested in, outreach and, and, and do those informational interviews. You know, that that work of, of a job search doesn't start the cycle before those positions get posted. It, it, it really requires some time. So I encourage you, you know, if, if the time is short, you got to spend more time each week. But if you've got a few years down the line, spending a couple of hours week by week, a few hours a month will we'll, uh, get you a long way towards um, uh, having a solid plan in place. And if you need help in developing that plan, please reach out to uh, Russ Your Career Services. We're here to assist you. And, and again, thank you, Dr. Corner, for, for being with us here today. We, we look forward to developing a nice catalog of conversations with college presidents. And, and I'm so pleased to have you um, on the seat for, for this first one. All right. Thank you, everybody. Fight on.